Oh, hello, hello. Today we are going to be talking about synapses and our senses. So, a synapse is when we have the end of the nerve meeting another cell or another nerve. There are two types. We have electrical synapses and then we have chemical synapses. The electrical synapses have a gap junction where the ions just flow straight through. Now, this is a two-way process. So one nerve can be talking to the other nerve, and the cell can be talking to the nerve, and vice versa. Now, there are advantages to electrical. It is faster for communication. We can synchronize, and it's a two-way transmission. But we also have chemical synapses. Chemical synapses is when we have synaptic vesicles that have neurotransmitters. They move through exocytosis. And then they are picked up by the next cell or nerve through receptors, specific receptors. So, looking at a chemical synapse, number one, the action potential arise. Number two, the vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane. The neurotransmitters are released into the synaptic cleft, which is in between the two cells. Number four, the neurotransmitters bind to the receptors on the neuron membrane or the next cell. And then they're allowed in. The ion channel opens, and then the ion channel closes. You might want to write these steps down. Again, another look at a chemical synapse. We have the synaptic vesicles that contain neurotransmitters. They fuse and the neurotransmitters are released and can be picked up by the neurotransmitter receptors on the next cell. Now, neurotransmitters. We have endorphins, which exhibit a pain impulse. We have acetylcholine, which is muscle contraction and REM sleep. We have dopamine, which is emotional responses. We have serotonin, which is muscle relaxers, induced sleep, hypersecretion, or which equals depression. We have melatonin, which regulates our circadian rhythm, or our natural time cycle. We have epinephrine, which is a vasodilator, which means it opens up your blood vessels, allowing more blood to flow through. We have neuroepinephrine which is for arousal and dreams and mood. Now when we look at them in combination, we see different things exhibit. Neuroepinephrine is for alertness, concentration, and energy. But when combined with serotonin, can cause anxiety, impulses, and irritability. Now serotonin by itself is for obsession, compulsion, and memory. And dopamine is pleasure, rewards, and motivation, and drive. Now, when serotonin and dopamine come into play, we have appetite, sex, and aggression. Or when neuroepinephrine come in with dopamine, we have attention. And when all three of these come together, it creates our mood and cognitive function. Now, some of our senses. We've already touched, talked about the sense of touch when we talked about the integumentary system. Today, we're going to be talking about sight. Sound and taste. So, talking with sound. The outside of the ear, we have the pinna and the lobe, and we have the external auditory canal. Once the sound moves into the auditory canal, it will hit our eardrum. This causes the bones inside the ear, the malleus, the incus, and the sphincters, to vibrate. Now, this vibration comes over to, this, to the inner ear and comes over to the cochlea. Remember, cochlea means snail, and that's what this looks like, is a snail. Now, this organ actually has fluid inside. So as these bones vibrate, it will vibrate the fluid and change the pressure. That pressure then moves out to the cochlear nerve. The eustachian tube here keeps the pressure equalized within your eardrum. It is the canal that links the middle ear to the throat. It helps equalize pressure between your inner ear and outer ear. 
Having the same pressure allows for proper transfer of the sound. And the eustachian tube is lined with mucus, like in your throat and nose, and can get clogged. How do we hear? The sound is made outside of the ear to the outside of the ear. The sound waves or vibrations travel down the auditory canal and strike the eardrum, also known as the tympanic membrane. This tympanic membrane vibrates. The vibrations are passed through the three tiny bones of the ear called the ossicles. Again, that is the malleus, the incus, and the sapies. These ossicles amplify the sound, sending the sound waves to the inner ear into the fluid-filled hearing organ called the cochlea, or that snail. Once the sound reaches the inner ear, it is then converted into the electrical impulse that the auditory nerve sends to the brain. The brain then translates these electrical impulses into sound. Now you have to be careful, because noise above 85 decibels over time can cause hearing loss. Now this is not just once in a while. But this is on a constant basis. It can cause uh, hearing loss. Now looking at the eye. On the outside of the eye, we have the eyelid. We have our pupil, which is the black portion that will grow and shrink to let in light or keep light out. We have the iris, which is the colorful part of our eye. And the sclera, which is the white portion of the eye. Now, when we look at the eye on the inside, we're going to start at the front, and we have an outside sort of window called the cornea. It is attached to the sclera, or the white part of the eye, at the conjunctivia. Inside of this, we have our iris and our lens. The lens helps focus the picture, and we'll send it back to the back of the retina. In the back of the retina, it is connected to the optic nerve which takes all these images and sends it to the brain. Now inside that is not shown, we do have vitreous fluid or a clear opaque fluid that is floating around. The cornea is the transparent window, transmit and focuses the light into the eye. The iris is the colorful part, regulates the amount of light that enters. The pupil is the dark center, the pupil changes size and rear response of the degree of illumination controlling the amount of light the eye lets in. The lens is the transparent structure behind the iris that focuses the light into rays that can be read by the retina. The retina is the nerve layer that lines the back of the eye. The retina senses light and creates impulses that are sent to that optic nerve that goes to the brain. There are two types of cells for the retina. We have the rod cells that are for black and white vision. And then we have the cone cells that are for colored vision. We have our optic nerve that connects the eye to the brain and carries the impulses from the retina to the brain where we can interpret those images. And then we have the vitreous fluid, which is the clear jelly-like substance that fills the middle of the eye. Cataracts. We have a normal eye over here, and we see cataracts on this one. We see a cloudy or haziness. It is the cloudiness of the natural lens of the eye responsible for focusing the light and making a clear picture. This is due to old cells dying and becoming trapped within the capsule. And over time, they accumulate along the lens, making it cloudy. Over time, this can actually cause blurry or fuzzy vision. And it's typically natural in aging, and it can cause blindness. Astigmatism. Astigmatism, instead of the cornea being round, it is actually oval. This causes differences in the focusing of the beam. With astigmatism, you typically see one or two things. They can either focus on the distance or they can focus on near. This tends to cause either nearsightedness or myopia or farsightedness called hyperopia. You do need to know these. Nearsightedness is myopia, farsightedness is hyperopia. Now talking about the tongue, we have our sense of taste. Taste is very much correlated with our sense of smell as well, that we'll get into 
probably in our next chapter or so. But inside of our mouth, we have our tongue, and our tongue has taste buds. Taste buds are called papilla. And those are the little bumps that you'll see. When one bump comes in flame, that's when you can actually see a larger taste bud. So we have the taste buds, or the papilla. And some are more specialized than others. They can all have a sense of taste and give some response, but they may have more of a signal for certain tastes, such as sweet at the tip, salty along the edges and the back, sour is mostly along the back. Now again, they can all taste something, but they may have an affinity or may sense more in these certain locations for these certain tastes. In the back of the throat, you have your tonsils that help filter out bacteria. And you have your epiglottis, or that hangy ball thing in the back of your throat. That is actually, that is actually a bulba sensor. It actually takes the food mass and it checks its size to make sure you're not swallowing something too big. If it is too big, it will cause you to gag. So your epiglottis actually causes your gag reflux. So we have five major senses, touch, smell, taste, and sight, and hearing, but not six majors. So when the spleen comes in, the hand says, it's not feeling right. The nose says, something smells fishy to me. There's more than meets the eye. It just doesn't make a lick of sense. And then he says, I hear you. He made a spleen getaway. Shouldn't you be filtering our blood or something? Poor little spleen. Well, bye for now.